Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Welcome back to the podcast today. I'm going to take a minute and share with you an interview with uh, Bryn Berger. And this was originally recorded for Simplify My Life, which was a tiny house virtual summit, a virtual summit of tiny house people. And you can find it online at simplifymy.life. I'm Carmen Shank, and I'm here today with Bryn Berger. She is the author of Simple Living Right Now, Ending Life's Chaos and Reclaiming Joy. And she's the mom on the rocks. You can find her at themomontherocks.com. Welcome, Bryn. Hi, Carmen. It's so good to see you. I know. (laughs) So tell me about your path to simplicity. And I know some of this story, but um, give me the the Reader's Digest version for those who don't know you. Sure. Well, um, my husband and I have two kids uh, who are now eight. Our son is eight and our son is, or our daughter is three. And about, gosh, three years ago now, uh, we had, our daughter was a newborn and I was binge watching HGTV like any good mother on maternity leave and um, saw a tiny house show. And at the time our son was four. And so we, my husband and I kind of had two problems. One was just sort of paycheck to paycheck living. Um, and the other was raising a child with special needs. So our son has some behavioral diagnosis and some anxiety. And so because of that, we knew public school was not really a good fit for him. Uh, so we, as we started to sort of dive into researching tiny living, it seemed like that was a potential solution for both of our our issues um so unbeknownst to my husband (laughs) I did a bunch of research and I sort of proposed to him hey I think we could do this and thankfully I married to a very kind easygoing hippie yeah and (laughs) he was like let's do it and so um yeah at the time we had a 15 acre farm in Virginia which was like our dream home we thought Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, we were sort of house poor because always had so much to do, cleaning, mending fence, fixing something. And so we listed our home thinking we'd have a ton of time to sell it and it sold overnight. (laughs) Not our plan. (laughs) And so we had a builder, we already had a tiny house builder who had become friends of us since then. And, um, but no builder can build a home for four plus a dog in two weeks. Right. That's how long we had to get out. (laughs) So, yes. uh, wow. right. Yeah. So we purchased a 36 foot fifth wheel and we gutted it and we basically built it to spec for what needed, we needed it to suit our family, which mm-hmm. um, is a family of four with a dog and our son's special needs. We needed to have an area to road school our kids and we needed to have an area for him to have some sensory needs met. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were able to do that. And within two weeks we sold our house, uh, custom fit a tiny And parked on a farm, a 20 acre farm in Ohio, which was, you know, two states away. And I accepted a new job and my husband went from always working full time to being a road schooling dad. So, you know, go big or go home, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like a pretty busy two weeks. It was a little crazy, but that's kind of how we live our lives. Yeah. Um, But truthfully, that single decision is not only probably the most judged decision from outsiders, but also we would probably say the best decision we'd ever made for our family. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it's funny how hindsight gives you really the clarity that you might not have in the moment, but um, yeah, you can, you can look it back on that and say that it's been a really good thing. So talk to me about your kitchen. What did you hang on to in your kitchen and what did you let go of? Well, I love to cook. Yes. Um, and I am one that likes to make things up as I go. Yeah. And my husband says that's when I do my best work. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I wish I would have had your book Kitchen <laughs> back then. Um, I do have it now and love it, but, um, I knew that I had to really cut down on the sort of large appliances. So I did some research on what other people that were living tiny now at the time. And of course the tiny house movements come a long way, even just three years ago, most people that were living tiny were either full-time RVers or they were people living on boats. Yeah. And so I knew that would be a little different, um, for what we, we needed cause we were full-time as a family. Mm-hmm. So I kept my crock pot, 
because that was a way for me to cook a meal during we were new. I knew we'd live somewhere that had four seasons. So Mm -hmm. two seasons of the year, I could most weeks um, work or be a road schooling mom and um, not have to think about Mm -hmm. our previous meal of the day. Yeah. Um, I wanted a refrigerator that was smaller than average, but large enough that I could um, make things ahead because we meal prep. Yeah. Um, and then our son's special needs calls for a pretty strict diet. So we're gluten-free um, and we also are pretty primarily whole foods household. Mm-hmm. Um, so what that meant was we just adjusted. Um, we do a lot of vertical storage. So in our kitchen, our um, produce hangs, mm-hmm. um, all of our produce, yeah. with the exception of our daughter's avocados, which are in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, most everything hangs. And then um, I shop more often, which was, right. that was the biggest adjustment for me, truly. I'm a couponer um, by nature. I love to have, save money and make a deal. And uh, so yeah, we just, we shop at farmer's markets and stuff. So we just go, we sort of have regular days. And instead of shopping for four to six weeks, right. one, one trip in between. Now I shop for two weeks and then go in between to get maybe another thing of milk or bananas mm-hmm. or something you might need. Yeah. Cool. So, um, well, same question about the bathroom. What did you hang on to? What did you, what did you let go of in that process of downsizing to fit? Uh, and remind me, do you have one bathroom or two? I don't remember. Sure. So we have a bath and a half and we were sort of prioritizing. We knew this wouldn't be our forever home because like Mm -hmm. I said, two weeks was not (laughs) ideal. (laughs) Um, But we also knew we have a son and a daughter, so we wanted them to have a little bit of privacy. So Mm -hmm. um, we have the half bath, which is truly a tiny half bath. I mean, there's (laughs) pretty much room to turn around in there and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, Just as a sink and a toilet. And so their room we built in storage under the sink and above um, like a traditional medicine cabinet behind the mirror. Mm -hmm. Um, And we store extra toilet paper and we store extra towels in theirs Mm -hmm. because obviously we want to keep medicine away from our kids. Right. Um, And then in our bath, we have similar storage, but we have an additional um, cabinet set of cabinetry above our toilet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have a standing shower and we also have an outdoor shower. So oh, uh, cool. for us, our kids love during spring and summer, this is a great way to get your, trick your kids into liking baths. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they just have like a play bath outside. And so we actually just have an old school large tote yeah. and they get bubble baths and toys and they have a great time. So um, we really just downsize like we would anything else, dishes, towels, we literally have what we need. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've hosted guests. We've had up to nine people in our 300 square feet for four day weekends, multiple times. Yeah. Tell them you have to bring your own pillows. You have to bring your own towels, everything else you can do. Yeah. Um, we have blankets extra and things like that and match air mattresses. But, um, yeah, those are the two things we just don't have extras. Like we Mm -hmm. would, we had extra closet space. Right. So I know you talk about um, your closet and you've got a system for your closet. Talk about that because I think that's a really interesting approach. Sure. So in Simple Living right now, um, which was sort of a book born out of traveling and speaking about simplicity and the benefits for mental health and the benefits, especially while raising children, um, I realized in discovering my own anxiety as an adult that clutter breeds toxicity. Yeah. (laughs) And so really removing all of the extra stimulation for both overstimulating for our son and then also for my anxiety really helped me to breathe. Mm -hmm. And so we have a rule, um, like a lot of tiny houses, we operate on old in, old out, new in. Mm -hmm. So anytime we get something new, we try to purge something old. We still purge every six to eight weeks and our kids expect that. So that's totally normal for them. But the biggest thing that we do is we operate on 50 items per person per season. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, we live in a four season state and we actually moved the summer to Tennessee. We relocated. Um, and there's still four seasons where we live. So we have an off season tote that we keep in storage. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I say storage, we don't pay for a storage unit. We have an under, um, storage under our home. Mm -hmm. And so we have one item. I'm not sure the size, maybe like 30 gallon tote, just your typical department store tote, plastic Mm -hmm. tote. Um, and then, each of us, all four of us have a small section of hang up clothes and three drawers. Mm -hmm. So that includes everything but your under things. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was super easy. I was able to get rid of like my pre-pregnancy clothes that I would never fit in again. (laughs) So all of those size tens that were judging me for years (laughs) had to hit the road. And it was cool because, you know, it, 
taught not only myself and my husband, but it taught our kids to really what it, what that feeling is like to bless others with your abundance, yeah. um, which is like, you know, goes one step further than just saying like, be kind, which is yeah. a thing for, for parents. Um, and also like I had a ton of really good gear. Like we are an outdoor family, we hike and climb. And, um, so I was able to give really solid pieces to people who could wear it right now and not cool. one day, maybe 10 years from now, I hope I could fit into it again. So yeah. Yeah, that, that rule has served as well. Um, and again, that does not include your under things because I don't want anyone to live with dirty underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think that's really helpful just in terms of if everything in your closet is something that suits you right this minute, right. this day, not sometime out there, it removes that possibility of looking at something and feeling um, some toxic thing, you know. Um, there's an author who talks about malignant things in your home. And I think it's such an interesting thing that I hadn't thought of until I read it, um, that there are some things like exercise equipment, clothes yeah. that don't fit today, um, things that have memories attached that are really negative. Yeah. Those things, you get the, that toxicity, that um, yeah. malignant item out of the house. That's a really good thing. <laughs> yeah. And as I, I mean, of course I meet tens of thousands of people traveling all over and women that I think are about the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, everybody has their own thing. Yeah, and I right. think for women especially, and, and definitely men as well, um, you want to feel confident in everything right. you wear. And right. it has changed my perspective completely that literally every piece of clothing that I own, and that includes my under things, I feel really good in it. And so if I gain weight, I replace things. If I lose yes. weight, I replace things. Yes. And so you know, so many of us have this wide size range and it's like, oh, I don't want to get rid of that because what if? Right. Well, everything I wear, I feel great in. And if I don't, I either return it or I give it away or I sell it or whatever, but it, it has to go. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of the ways that you sell clothes. Do you have some um, things that have worked for you on that front? Yeah. So I think for us, we're big. And I think, again, you know, the tiny house, other tiny housers, it's really, a, it truly is a community. I think mm -hmm. it's a lot of people who are very like-minded. Yeah. Um, and so for us, we really like to be as sustainable as possible mm -hmm. and to shop locally and spend our resources where we live. And so for us, we use a lot of like the Facebook, Facebook marketplace or Facebook. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, so we are a part of a lot of different tiny house forums. So we know other tiny houses that live near us. And I say near, we're in Tennessee. They might be two hours away. But if we're selling really great stuff and it's going to save them and we can meet them in the middle, we'll just make a day trip out of it with our kids. That's great. Meet other people. And so, and you know, they're saving money. You're getting rid of something you don't need and making space. And you know, it's, it, you make a little bit of your cash back. So. Mm -hmm. Well, talk to me a little bit about that, um, that community of tiny house people. There's a lot of people who have young children yeah. in tiny houses. And I think one of the fears that people have that are looking from the outside in is, can I raise a kid in a small space without sacrificing something for, in terms of their childhood? Talk sure. about that a little bit. So um, one of the reasons why I was ever asked to speak in the first place was because people think that we're insane to live <laughs> four people in a dog and 301 square feet. I would say that extra one foot is super yeah. when you're talking about so little. Um, truly, I feel like it ha living tiny has given me as a mom the gift of time. So I clean my house in 45 minutes on a Saturday every week, yeah. and that includes laundry, that includes sanitizing bathrooms, all of it. So. Mm -hmm. Formerly, I was just like working all the time to pay for a house I wasn't even spending time in. And then when right. I was there, I was cleaning, which made me miserable and tired. And now I can be intentional about my time. So I can <laughs> choose to spend my time on things that make me happy, make my family happy. Um, the other thing is with our kids specifically, um, my husband and I, I feel like are, um, and, and like so many people now, I feel like we're kind of starting as a culture to come around to the idea of getting back to our roots and that sort of pioneer culture. And, you know, we want our kids to have life skills. We don't want them to just yes. graduate from high school and then go to college because they think they should and whatever. We want them to do what makes them happy, whether that's a trade skill or, or mm -hmm. whatever that might be. So um, we start, we live as sustainably as we can. Um, you know, we've road schooled for two years, which was the best fit for our special needs son. And, 
you know, the garden was one of his huge priorities. That was his responsibility. He was super proud of it. Oh, um, cool. he, he learned to sew this year, which was something oh, cool. he asked yeah. to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are such valuable skills that we're, we're graduating children right now who are really, truly still kids yeah. and they don't know how to fry an egg or do their laundry or right. you know, basic things, balance a checkbook. And so I think it's, it's freed up enough time for my husband and I, one, to focus on each other. Um, which, you know, for our opinion is that, you know, you're not going to raise emotionally healthy kids when you are so jacked up yeah. and so being able to free up your own headspace to work on yourself and invest in your relationships, whether that's a spouse or a partner or a friendship or a, you know, your sisters and brothers or parents or whomever, right. um, and be able to set appropriate boundaries and show your kids what that looks like. Yeah. Um, instead of, whereas before we were literally working ridiculous hours. We were like ships in the night. You know, it was easier for us to get frustrated with each other and take the kids here, take the kids there, deal with this. And it's not that those life things don't still happen when you live tiny because they certainly do. And I always try to make a point to talk about that. Mm -hmm. When you're raising what I call an extreme child, there are a lot of medical bills. There are a lot of appointments. There's a lot of therapy. There's always changing medications and judgment and all this other yucky stuff that goes with it. But I can't, there is, there aren't human words to speak to what, how it's changed our lives for the better to be able to have the time to discuss those things together, to mm-hmm. reflect on those things, to kind of just sit in your own headspace and make good decisions and not feel so overwhelmed all the time. Yeah. So I feel like we're able to give our children so much more mm-hmm. and they don't even realize they have less to be honest with you. For our son, it's been a tremendous change for the better because he needs less stimulation and less choices. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we live in such a sort of microwave, fast paced, instant gratification society. Um, And this allows our kids to realize that it's okay to slow down. Mm -hmm. Okay. To take the time to wait um, and to see what can develop in that. And whether that's growing a garden or whether that's hand cranking your laundry, um, which is not for everyone. And honestly, (laughs) at first I thought it was not for me either. But when you have a son who is tremendously ADHD combined type, but he can crank out some laundry that smells awesome and is air drying in a hot minute. So. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So it, uh, it uses skills and uses right. energy. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, and it gives him responsibility. And yeah. we're able to teach things about conservation because it uses less water, about reusing. I mean, there's just a lot that goes into it. So. Talk to me a little bit about your book, Simple Living Right Now. Um, You've got uh, a rule of five, and I think if you, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you go through various aspects of the house and talk about five things to be uh, thinking about in each area. Am I right on that? Tell me a little bit about your book. Yeah, so I have always known I wanted to write. Um, Yes. And I had been a paid writer for a long time as sort of a side hustle, and then Living Tiny has actually provided an opportunity for me to chase that dream um, full time, which is would never have happened before. Yeah. Um, and so I had traveled for about a, a little over a year and I kept getting the same questions all the time. And I'm very much a type A personality. So like I said, for us going tiny, it was about identifying a problem and proposing a solution. So yeah. I was getting all these same questions and I thought, well, if no one else is going to talk about it, I should talk about this. And I was already speaking everywhere about the same things. And so it was sort of things I had already had in my mind. And sure. um, so Simple Living right now basically walks you through your house room by room. And we, uh, I don't remember who it was. Somebody jokes, it's actually on the back of my book cover about it being the Marie Kondo for people who don't have time to hold everything they own and give it things. <laughs> Because I'm a mom. I don't have time for that. Yeah, Um, right. I love her. I love her intention. Right, Um, right. And so I have gratitude for all of my things, but I did not have time to go through that process in two weeks. So, right, exactly. um, A lot of people come to tiny house events or they, you know, find me online and they're like, man, I wish I could do what you do. And I always say, well, you can. Because I think a lot of times in America, we forget that we have a choice. Right. Um, And so I always tell people, like, even though it's hard to hear, if you're in a position you don't like, you got yourself there by your choices. So when Spence and I, my husband and I were in debt, um, it was because of choices we made. And so some of it wasn't our fault. It was medical stuff, but sure. others of it were, it was, it was just, that's how it is. And right. so we had to come up with a solution to get ourselves out. Mm-hmm. And so, so many people will come and say, ah, you know, I want to do it, but I have 30 years or 20 years or 
40 years of crap build up. Right. Like right. And so essentially the book capitalizes on the idea that tiny living may not be for everyone, but simple living should be. Yeah. And here are the benefits for your mental health and for your overall um, feeling of happiness and joy, because I think we forget that we get to choose that. Mm -hmm. And so it walks you through, like you said, the rule of five. So each room in your home, um, and you were interviewed for that book. And I talk about, um, I quote you a lot in the chapter about the kitchen, which I love. Um, and the kitchen was a really, it was a joy for me because I do love to cook so much. Yeah. And now I really like, that's one of my favorite places in our tiny house because yeah. I love it. I love the colors. I love every, every piece of decoration that I chose. Mm -hmm. Our backsplash is one of the, my favorite things in our home. Oh, cool. Um, so all of those little pieces. And then um, I, I definitely talk about like what happens about if you have sentimental attachment, because that's a big thing for me. I've lost a lot of loved ones along the way. Yeah. And the kitchen is a place I was able to capitalize on that saving. Um, so like, I didn't want my grandma's jewelry. I wanted her potato masher. And I taught oh, a joke cool. about potato masher in the book and the kitchen <laughs> chapter and how that's like the thing that refuses to let our door, our drawer shut in our kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> But that reminds me of her every time because she used that. And now I don't have room for a big mixer. Right. And so I use that potato masher. And so my kids get to use that and we mm -hmm. get to use that. And so it's like bringing her back to life in some oh, small way cool. for us. Yeah. So you get to relive those memories and it's so exciting by choosing the things that you really care about. Mm -hmm. One of the things, since you mentioned the kitchen, one of the sure. things I really loved about a tiny house kitchen is how efficient it is because you are not walking all over real estate to get right. to the stuff you want. <laughs> right. I think it's really nice. When you talk to people about like, no one can um, outfit a house with more uh, multifaceted functional <laughs> items than a tiny house. <laughs> that is so true. Everything has to be more than one thing or it yeah. doesn't stay very long. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think that's also a really good point is that it doesn't have to be, you, it doesn't have to be perfect when you move in. It right. can change and evolve with you. And if there's oh, one yeah. item that you just don't use, well, you know, get it out of there and replace whatever it is you do need. And, and we've done, we've done remodels, I guess you would say to our house. We're, we're on our third one. Okay. Um, but, you know, like I said, it, it wasn't our plan to gut a fifth wheel, but that was what right. we had to do with our time. And we knew it wouldn't be forever. But right now, our kids are getting older. You know, when we moved in, right. Sparrow wasn't even one, and Briggs was four and a half. And so now, with an eight and a three-year-old, they have different needs. And, you know, now he's kind of wanting his own privacy. And so, um, most recently, we separated them. So, they have beds on opposite sides of the room, which is separated by a wardrobe. So, they have their own privacy. And we built a rock wall was part of our son's sensory needs. And so now Sparrow has her own kind of little area and Briggs has his own little calming area with a reading nook. And they have these climbing holes where they can kind of come together and have fun. Uh, but that was not there in the beginning. We had no idea and that didn't suit our needs at that time. So you sure. will see how your needs evolve, whether you're mm -hmm. a family or a single person or a couple or whatever. Yeah. Well, and one of the things I also love about that is that since it's a small space, it's not costing you a fortune to make oh, some changes no. like that. If you have to replace a roof, it's a fraction Absolutely. <laughs> of what it costs on a normal house. And, 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 and the interior is the same way. Yeah. And you talked about the tiny house community too. And that's been something that we loved. Like raising our kids around tiny house festivals is probably the best thing ever because it's the <laughs> one thing left in our world where you can actually trust your friends to, I know our kids come and hang out with you and are like, Oh, Miss Carmen, here's some cucumbers. Can I have a peach? Like, you know, and it's just, <laughs> And we yeah. hang out and take care of each other. And same thing goes for, you know, I know my husband as a mechanic has helped you guys out with your school yeah. bus, just right. the same as, you know, um, Chris Straffy has helped, helped me build a bookshelf for one of my show displays. And yeah. everybody can come up with new ideas or come in your house and say, oh, have you thought about doing that? It's like, oh, why didn't I think of that? And so it's just really cool to see what other people are doing and that it truly is um, people that come together with their motivation is to help everyone live their best life, which is yeah. don't see everywhere. Yeah. And, and that's really a beautiful thing because, sure. I mean, well, it can get a little weird out there. <laughs> and yeah. So it's, yeah. it's nice to have all of us normal people together. Right. I mean, right. when there's such a prescriptive life in yes. culture uh, and there are people who decide not to live the prescription, it's really kind of fun to hang out with other people who choose yes. not to live the prescription because wait, you mean I'm not weird? Right. It's so <laughs> I mean, I'm weird, but. <laughs> right. 
I agree totally. But, <laughs> so that's one of the fun things about it. So this this is gonna this question will overlap a little bit with what you said about your book because I think they they have the same answer maybe. But what do you say to someone who has too much stuff? They are feeling overwhelmed, and that is, you know, something that we um, that we hear a lot, and that yeah. we feel a lot. That overwhelm from just having so much. Yes. What is um, what is the thing that they need to keep in mind as they tackle something? What is what what do they tackle, and what is the thing to keep in mind as you get started? Sure. Well, I think um, I was an, uh, a public educator. And so as a natural teacher, I always like to give people sort of practical tips. Sure. So I think I always tell people the first thing is to know your why. So, and I talk about that in the book for us, our why doesn't look like a lot of people's because our, our why was meeting our son's needs where he was at that time. Yeah. So if tiny living stops becoming what's right for our family, then we'll change. Right. Um, but right now it's the best thing we could be doing and we love it. So the first thing is know your why, because there will be times in 300 square feet or 200 square feet where you really questioning your decisions, whether you're by yourself or with other people. Right. <laughs> so know your why. That's the yeah. first thing. Um, the second thing is I am a big believer in continual education. And so I always tell people, especially if you feel overwhelmed by your stuff or by all of the things you need to do to go tiny, whether it's insurance or certifications or the build yes. or we'll do I DIY or what type of tiny, I mean, there's right. a million, or even just what kind of toilet. Right. Um, most of us who live tiny could talk about those logistics all day. So what I always say is educate yourself. Now that might look like going, finding a tiny house event near you. It might mm -hmm. look like renting tiny first. It might yeah. look like buying a course. I have a course online. A lot of us sell courses um, I, my book or your book, if you, you know, just one thing, pick it, make sure you're not buying above your means because that was part of tiny living as well as that financial freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of us, I know you for sure. Definitely. I do is try to make our resources, um, available for everyone price wise, because yeah. we truly believe in our lifestyle and we do it cause we love it. Right. Um, so we want it to be available for everyone. So know your why. Find yeah. a resource that works for you. Yes. And then third, I would say, start with one thing. So one thing I, you said in, our book, in my book, and I quote you on, is to start small. And I tell people, um, for me, I, I think really big. So I would start with a whole room. Right. But for you, it might be a closet or just your drawer. Look, if you don't want to commit, um, start with your front <laughs> drawer because it's yeah. all junk, right? We've determined right. that with a name. But start somewhere and start today. So yeah. right now, don't wait. Like if you're listening to this, you're watching this, get up when you're done, press pause and walk to that junk drawer or walk to your closet or whatever you choose. If it's just your shoes, yeah. and purge that area. Yeah. And it may take lots of sessions and depending on what piece of education you went with, that's probably going to walk you through that. Mm -hmm. um, I know your book does that for people. I know mine and my course does that for people. Ethan has a great course um, that actually my husband and I used. So lots of people have good resources. So find what fits your needs and your lifestyle and you can invest in and walk yourself through that, but never, ever, ever lose sight of your why, mm -hmm. because you're going to need that a lot of steps along the way. That's so true. That's so true. And I believe we're out of time, but I really appreciate it. I know you've got another event that you need yeah. to scoot off to, but I just really appreciate having you along for the ride. I know yeah. our, our listeners are, are really going to appreciate how practical and straightforward your answers are. So Bryn's book is a really great resource. It's called Simple Living Right Now, um, Ending Life's Chaos and Reclaiming Joy by Bryn Berger. So make sure you check that out. Um, I think that's a really great place to start in terms of thinking through how to simplify whether or not you're going tiny. This will help you, okay? Simple living right now, ending life's chaos and reclaiming joy. Thanks for joining me. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube, please do. And you can download us on iTunes. The music is composed by William Kirkpatrick, lyrics by Louisa Stead, arranged and performed by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at carmenshank.com.